On this week's Lazy Sunday slash Monday upload is psychologist Paul Bloom. Bloom has recently written a book called Against Empathy, and this excerpt was taken from a talk he gave at the University of Missouri on that topic. Bloom's thesis runs counter to prevailing wisdom that empathy is purely a source of good, and the only problem is that there's not enough of it in the world. As Bloom points out through various experimental and real-world examples, empathy is myopic, innumerate, and biased, and that ultimately leads to bad decision-making. This idea appeals to me immensely since it's synonymous with people that make emotionally-based arguments. For example, someone vigorously defends a government program like Stop Violence Against Women, and when you question them why such a narrow focus, they'll point to the fact that a woman was killed by her spouse the previous week and it's been all over the news. But that's anecdotal, and it's irrational. So what we should do instead is be compassionate for victims, but when it comes to making policy decisions, we need to distance ourselves from the anecdote and make evidence-based decisions. Anyway, let me know what you think about Paul Bloom's case against empathy. What I mean by, um, by empathy is what used to be known as sympathy by the scholars of the 17th and 18th century. And, and, and I draw here upon the work of, uh, and this is the way many psychologists use the term, but they get it from Adam Smith. Um, and Adam Smith describes the following situation as exemplifying empathy. Uh, when uh, we see a person, we place ourselves in his situation and become in some measure the same person with him and then form some idea of his sensations and even feel something which, though weaker in degree, is not altogether unlike them. Um, so in, what, we, we put ourselves in other people's shoes. And Smith gives an example. When we see a stroke aimed and just ready to fall upon the leg arm, or, arm of another person, we naturally shrink and draw back our own leg or arm. And when it does fall, we feel it in some measure and are hurt by it as well as the sufferer. And like, here's my favorite illustration of an empathic <laughs> response. Now, there's been a huge amount of interest in, in the psychological and neural mechanisms of empathy. We know now from a couple of decades of work that when you feel empathy with somebody, someone who's in pain, for instance, you yourself feel, a, feel pain, perhaps to a lesser degree. And in fact, the same neural systems that would be active if you yourself was being poked or shocked become active if you watch somebody being poked or shocked and feel empathy for them. Um, sometimes empathy is related to the more general capacity we have to mirror other people's behavior in both thought and action. Um, this is, um, I, I forget where I got this actually, but it's from a soccer player, and he misses this big kick. And so he puts his hands on the side of his head in anguish. That's not very interesting. But what's interesting is how the people around him <laughs> respond. Before we get into the issues of empathy, one thing that even the biggest empathy fan should agree with is that there's other forces motivating good, re good moral reasoning and good moral action besides empathy. So take a classic philosophical example. You're walking by the woods and you see a drowning child, drowning in the water, struggling in the water. Now, everybody knows the right thing to do is reach in and pull the child out. Now, is empathy involved? Well, it could be. You could feel what it's like to be drowning. Imagine experience vicariously drowning. Or you could imagine what it'd be like for the parents of the child to hear their child has drowned. Feel that sorrow and pain through an imaginative empathic extension. You could do all that, but that's ridiculous. You just, yeah, your kid's drowning. You reach in and pull the kid out. You don't need to go through all this empathic hoo-ha. You just, you know, you, you, you respond based on your, you know, drowning kid is bad. Shouldn't, shouldn't let kids drown. There are cases where empathy pushes us another way, and morality, a, a, a more attuned moral sense, pushes us in a different way. And my favorite example here is from Dan Batson, who's a, you know, a really astute empathy scholar, and very pro-empathy, but also very, very cognizant of empathy's limitations. So he does a study in which he tells people about Sherry Summers, an imaginary young girl. And Sherry Summers has a de degenerative disease, and she's going to die relatively soon. And there's a treatment that won't save her life, but it will alleviate her pain. And he discusses this in great detail, describing her situation, describing her family, and says, but she's on a line up. She, there, there, there's a list for who could get this treatment. Treatment's in short supply. It's a fair list. It's based on all sorts of fair considerations. And she is low on the list. She is never going to get the treatment. And then she said, and then so, so Batson asked the subject, should we move her up the list? And if you move her up the list, that means someone else who's on the list is going to go down. 
and not get the treatment. And most people say, no. You know, it's sad, da, 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 but, but if it's a fair list, then no. Then he has another group, and he tells them exactly the same thing. But he adds just two sentences of the form, try to feel what she's feeling. Put yourself in her shoes. Now the results flip. And most people say, yeah, I'd move her up the list. And the way Batson puts it, and I agree, is that, that empathy is clouding you to a more objective moral judgment. And upon reflection, the first answer is the right one. You, should, you shouldn't move her up the list just because you feel what she feels. Empathy is distorting your judgment. Now, here, as more generally, we can see empathy as a spotlight. What empathy does is it zooms you in on, on an, you typically an individual, and motivates your concern and your kindness. And fans of empathy view its powers as that. In fact, it's often been, been argued that, that empathy can take someone who's indifferent and, and, and catalyze their moral response. This is not a, a new insight. Um, all sorts of people have pointed this out, so in different ways. So Joseph Stalin, for instance, apocryphally said, a single death is a tragedy, a million deaths is a statistic. Well, Mother Teresa said, if I look at the math, I will never act. If I look at the one, I will. And there's a large body of psychological research looking at it. So say the work of uh, Deborah Small and George Lowenstein, um, in one study they gave people a description of a crisis and gave them great detail and asked how much money would it saw, asked them to donate to charity. And in the study they gave a little bit more than a dollar on average. But another group had no statistics but were given a picture, uh, a picture and a name. And there the donation shot up. Subsequent work by other scholars find that you'll give more to save one person than to save five people so long as that one person has a face and a name. Now, so, so empathy there serves as a spotlight. And what I want to suggest is, here's where we can see the worries about empathy. Spotlights have narrow focus. And spotlights only focus on what you point them to, and sometimes you point them in the wrong places. As a result, empathy is biased, enumerate, concrete, and myopic. Now, one way to bring this out is, I want to look at some real-world cases that have inspired moral concern in the United States over these last many years. So one example is, and there's many cases like this, a case of baby Jessica, who was a little girl stuck in a well. When she was stuck in a well, all of America was transfixed by, by her plight. More recently, uh, in 2005, Natalie Holloway, uh, a, a, a young teenager, uh, was lost in Aruba, presumably kidnapped. And, um, and there was a huge uh, commotion about this. And more recently still, there was a mass shooting in Newtown, Connecticut, not far from where I live, in Sandy Hook Elementary School, which became the number one news story for a very long time. Now these are all significant and real events, and they should focus our concern. But people like Paul Slovic have pointed out the disproportionate nature of this concern. So Slovic points out that when the world was transfixed by Holloway, there was a, a famine in Darfur, of which tens of thousands, possibly hundreds of thousands of people were dying. Yet Holloway got 13 times more coverage on network news than the Darfur famine. Um, mass shootings are a terrible thing. But if you look at the numbers, and you calculate the proportion of homicides in the United States that are mass shootings, it's 0.1%. And what that means is if you could snap your fingers and make it so there will never be another mass shooting in the United States again, no one will ever notice, looking at the numbers, that you did that. This is like statistical rounding error. And so the point isn't that these cases don't matter. It's that they don't matter to the proportion that we give them to. They don't matter as much as we tend to think that they do. Then there's also the issue of bias. This was a, a, a cartoon done by, a, by an artist at the, at the midst of the Ebola crisis, meant to comment on the fact that journalists focus obsessively on the very few white victims of the disease while ignoring the, the far more black victims of the disease. And, and you don't need telling that there are definitely strong racial biases in our interests and concerns, not only in who we're interested in, but who we are retributive towards. Uh, this is from Jennifer Eberhardt's work. Eberhardt points out that holding everything else constant, um, you are far more likely to be executed if convicted of murder if you look like the person on the right than the person on the left. It's not just being seen as African-American, it's the actual extent of, of one's skin color. 
Um, again, this is hardly a secret. Um, the Onion recently satirized this by talking about an imaginary trial where they say, judge rules white girl will be tried as black adult. Um, and the courtroom, uh, the courtroom artist was instructed to depict her not as this, but as that. Um, now, I'm not saying that empathy is to blame for all of this. I think there's general patterns of bias and focus on identifiable victims that, that, that transcend any single emotion. My point, rather, is that empathy is uniquely vulnerable to this, because empathy zooms you in on an individual. Um, this point was nicely made by the, by the, the writer, uh, writing quite some time ago, uh, Annie Dillard, who writes, um, there are 1.2 billion people alive now in China. To get a feeling for what this means, simply take yourself and all your singularity, importance, complexity, and love, and multiply by 1.2 billion. See? Nothing to it. And, um, and certainly, the neural findings of empathy, where they look for neural signatures of empathy, find that they're exquisitely sensitive to facts like in-group, out-group, race, nationality, and so on. In one study, for instance, um, they, took, they tested Europeans, and, they, and people would witness as another person received an electric shock. If that other person was described as being a fan of the same soccer team as the subject, Parts of the brain associated empathy would light up. They would feel that person's pain. If the person was described as a fan of an opposing soccer team, there would be no empathic response. More than that, parts of the brain associated with pleasure would light up as they watched that person being shocked. Now, one response to this is, fine, empathy isn't perfect. It's biased, it zooms you in on individuals and so on. But still, it's better than nothing. It makes the world a better place, maybe not perfectly so. But it's easy to see that this is mistaken. So start with a hypothetical example. Um, imagine there's a vaccine program in place that saves the lives of dozens of children a year. Then imagine one child dies from the vaccine as a product of the vaccine. The vaccine program, I would argue, would certainly be shut down. Even though, because you could feel what it would be like to be the child or the parents of the child killed, well, it's hard. you can't feel for the lives of people who would have died but didn't because they got the vaccine. Take a real world case. Um, in 1987, um, Willie Horton was released from the, from the Massachusetts uh, prison on a furlough program. And he went on to, to commit assault and rape. As a result, Michael Dukakis, who was the governor at the time running for president, it was considered a humiliating failure for Dukakis and contributed, contributed to him losing the presidential election. Now, it turns out that analyses of the furlough program revealed that, that taking everything into account, including cases like Willie Horton, the furlough program was leading to less crime. But it didn't feel that way to people. And it, because you could imagine what it would be like to be somebody, you could empathize with somebody assaulted and raped and have a huge emotional response. But you can't have a similar response to people who, who would have been hypothetically assaulted and raped but weren't. It, leads you, it, it, it gives rise to no feeling. And so there's an asymmetry between negative results, which have this huge effect on us, versus causing positive changes, which, which is a statistical abstraction that leaves us unmoved. Um, or take a bigger case. Take third world aid. So there's a huge debate over whether the billions of dollars that, 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 that uh, countries like the United States send to developing countries actually make the world better as opposed to having no effect or, having, um, or, or even having a deleterious effect. And you could see all sorts of ways in which our empathy could drive us to help and, uh, and lead to counterproductive reactions. I'll give one example from Linda Pullman. So Linda Pullman uh, interviewed um, warlords in Africa who would chop off the arms of children. And she asked them, why do you do this? And the response she got from more than one person surprised her. They said, we do this for you. When, when, um, when, when there's atrocities, it drives an American and European response. And, they, and NGOs come to that area. When NGOs come, they pay taxes to the warlords who are there. And so warlords profit from the attention of these people. Um, and so they do it to exploit the empathy of, of wealthy people and then profit from their response. Or take another case, there are many child beggars in Africa and India. When you encounter one of these people, it seems like the best thing in the world to do is to give the starving child 
some money or some food. But under most analyses, when you do so, you support a criminal organization which, um, which ends up enslaving and often maiming uh, uh, many, many children. And so there are better ways to help children in Africa and India, but the immediate empathic response in these circumstances is not only counterproductive, but it's exploited by people who, who themselves are doing terrible things to children. Now, the answer to this is not, so you should do nothing because of unintended consequences and bad side effects and so on. Uh, rather, I think a better answer is from the motto of the effective altruists who talk about uh, that when you decide what to do, you should use both your heart and your head. I've argued here that empathy has these problems. It's bias and numerate, concrete, and myopic. It directs our concern to the wrong places. But you can wonder, what replaces it? What else do we have? And I want to go back to the slogan about the heart and the head. I want to zoom first on the head. So Adam Smith is the number one champion. He wrote the book on empathy. Um, and then there's a part of the book where he, where he asks, so when we're kind to strangers in faraway lands, when we are kind when it doesn't benefit us, what explains this? And his answer is, it's not empathy. It's not the soft power of humanity. It's not that feeble spark of benevolence with nature, which nature has lifted up in the human heart. Rather, it is reason, principle, conscience that calls to us with a voice capable of astonishing the most presumptuous of our passions that we are but one of the multitude in no respect better than any other in it. Um, and this is sometimes called the principle of impartiality. And it shows up in various forms in every moral system, of every religious moral system, various forms of the golden rule, our Confucian sayings, as well as every moral philosophy, whether it's a, it's a utilitarian saying we should add up pain and pleasure, not caring whose pain and pleasure it is, or the Kantian saying that we should follow universal principles of broad applicability, or someone like John Rawls saying we should make our decisions behind a veil of ignorance, not knowing who we are. These theories differ in all sorts of ways, but what they have in common is the idea that true moral action involves distancing oneself, not engaging, but distancing oneself. So at one point then Smith says, what do you need to be a good person? And he says, it's not feeling, it's not depth of feeling. Depth of feeling will mess you up. You need two things to be a good person. Here are the two things you bequeath to somebody that I would give to my child if I want my child to be good. And the first is smarts, superior reasoning and understanding. Why? Because to be a good person, you have to anticipate the consequences of your actions. You have to be able to figure out what's going to happen if you do this. And that requires smarts. Maybe that's all that smarts is in the end. And then second, he says self-command. It's an archaic term we now call self-control. Why do you need that? You need that because even if you know the right thing to do, you might, not, you might be tempted to do something else. So you have to have the, the, the self-command to hold back on your bad impulses. With that in mind, let's go back to psychopathy. This is the hair psychopath test. These are the items that are diagnostic of being a psychopath. You can quickly go through them and score yourself if you want to. Um, it is true that one of the items is callousness, lack of empathy. But the studies have been done, and it turns out that your score on this sub-item has no predictive power on future criminal action, which is where most of the studies are done. If you had somebody in prison and you had given a psychopath test, what would predict how likely they are to end up back in prison? How likely they are to reoffend and harm somebody? It's the items of factors three and four items. And none of this would have surprised Adam Smith, because factors three and four involve things like impulsivity, lack of realistic goals, irresponsibility, um, certainly a criminal past, poor control. If you want to know who's likely to rape, to kill, to insult, don't measure their empathy, measure their self-control. And finally, there's the heart. Now, David Hume famously, and I think accurately pointed out, that in order to be a good person, you need some sort of motivation. Unless you have some sort of emotional pull driving you to be a good person, I guess it would be a push, driving you to be a good person, um, you're not going to. You might know all the moral answers in the world, but that will do nothing for you. Um, as he put it famously, reason is not only to be the slave of the passions. And I have no argument against that. But all I'll point out is, you don't need, the, the, the push does not have to be empathy. It could be a general diffused compassion, a caring for others. I think what you need to be to be a good person is, 
a compassion, you have to care for others, call it compassion, call it loving kindness. And then rather cold, hard rationality to figure out how to best affect the goals for yourself and for others.